Of all the regions upon the four corners of Uthalpaba, there are none of greater importance, past, present, or future, than the region of Akal. As of the end of the Twilight Era, the region of Akal was dominated by five different hunter-gatherer tribes who subsisted off of the land in a mutual alliance. Each tribe had an elder leading them, and each of the five elders together formed the Elder Council, a religious figurehead who worshipped a great and mystical being. The being in question was a mighty bird of flame and light unlike anything upon the entire continent of Usapaba. This great phoenix flew around the Oidegal Mountains and made its home upon the highest peak, Mount Cheo. The Elder Council revered this great phoenix as the god of fire, light, avians, dusk, and dawn, and called the great beast Unima'u. Not only did these elders lead the tribe, but they led the phoenix cult dedicated to Unima'u, for which the five tribes of Akau were all a part of. Under the direction of the Elder Council, many rites and rituals were performed in honor and worship of the phoenix, such as creating large effigies of Unima'u and crafting great sacrificial fires to burn food, livestock, and hostile tribes from across the Athwart River. These large rituals were staged by the Elder Council from the city of Akau, a city that served more as a meeting point for the tribes to trade and worship rather than a proper city. For unknown centuries, the tribes of Akau would worship the phoenix but to no avail. Unima'u remained silent and disinterested in Akau, never once giving so much as acknowledgement to their worship. And yet, the phoenix cult lived on. The status quo continued for a very long and unknown time, until one young man named Esheker came up with an idea. He would break the silence with his god by climbing up the peaks of the Oidegal Mountains to speak face to face with Unima'u. Sheker was laughed at, jeered at, called a heretic, and even exiled from Akau for such a notion. Exiled, Sheker fled to the southeast to Horjon, a land occupied by a friendly tribe who similarly worshipped the phoenix, though without the same rituals and leaders as Akau. Despite his exile, Sheker was not deterred from his idea and for decades he gathered supplies and trained his mind and body for the great journey up the mountains. Until finally, one day, a Sheker decided he was ready. For months, a Sheker climbed the mountains alone and poorly equipped. Yet through some great miracle he reached the peak of the world, though within an inch of his life. At the arrival of a Sheker, the phoenix was shocked, yet impressed and sympathetic, and would do something never before witnessed. Unima'u healed the ailments of Asheker and kept him warm with a brilliant light and spoke to him in a song of light and flame for many days. At the end of Unima'u's great song, Asheker was gifted the ability to wield the power of the sun at his fingertips to cast sun magic, or Ufieldma as they called it. With this great ability within his grasp as proof, Asheker was instructed to return to Akal, unify the five tribes, become their king, and to wait until the solstice on the longest day of the year. The Sheker followed these orders exactly. He climbed down the Oidegal Mountains, this time with much more ease, made his way to a cow in the city, and walked right up to the Elder Council, showing them his newfound powers. The Elder Council was enraged and in denial to the point of ordering his execution despite the proof, so a Sheker told them to wait until the solstice, for something surely would occur. The Elder Council obliged to at least this, and promised to kill Asheker should nothing happen. Months went by as Asheker sat in prison until finally the day came, and from the skies Unima'u flew across as a spark of flame and landed in the city of Akau with majesty to speak once more to Asheker. The Elder Council fetched him in the sixth boat with Unima'u, who crowned King Asheker I to rule Akau through the guidance of Unima'u and similarly taught the Elder Council the use of Ufieldma so that they too may use the power of the sun. Unima'u vowed every year on the same day to return once more and give needed instruction and guidance before taking off into the skies. The crowning of King Asheker I and the unification of the five tribes into the nation of Akau marks the very day the Dawn Era began. Instantly, King Asheker I and the Elder Council were at odds with one another, despite Asheker's great deed in breaking the silence with their god, and the two parties would perpetually fight for power for governance of the five tribes. 
As promised, year after year, Unimu'u came down to speak to the Elder Council and King Sheker I, giving them new advice, guidance, and knowledge each time. First, they were taught the creation of parchment and the creating of a writing system, so that they may write down Unimu'u's words verbatim. Next, they were taught all they would need to properly start civilization. Agriculture and irrigation, mining, metallurgy and bronze, the wheel, and so forth. The Phoenix would also aid in mediating and organizing the government of the Elder Council by splitting the two and assigning different tasks and duties. The Elder Council would lead the Phoenix cult and serve as the religious head, writing down and organizing every single thing the Phoenix says and putting it into a holy religious tome called the Igorites and transcribing it into many different copies as well as ending the sacrificial rites and replacing them with tributary ones. The Elder Council would also lead their own respective tribe from which they came and served as advisors to King Ashekar I. On the other hand, King Ashekar I would busy himself with matters of governance and infrastructure, which the Elder Council would often mediate between him and the tribes. Ashekar largely focused on the internal and didn't bother with the outside world. He had far too much to worry about in his homeland building farms, mines, temples, homes, helping to found towns, roads, and other needed infrastructure to lead a cow down the path of being a proper civilization, and one with a relatively high standard of living. All the while, as King Ashekar I led, the Elder Council stood in his way. The tribes often fought and bickered amongst one another, the counselors didn't relay information well and did their own thing. It seemed that they stepped into Ashekar's path in every possible way. Two decades of successful though frustrated building continued, and all the while Ashekar looked southeast across the river, observing the tribe of Horjon. King Ashekar I admired Horjon for its unity, and was sympathetic due to their similar worship of Unimu'u, and since they gave him shelter during his exile. King Ashekar I would often trade with the tribe of Horjon, giving them knowledge in exchange for goods, helping Horjon to thrive side by side with the cow. Hojan praised the Shekhar for his help in a time when the Elder Council did nothing but turn a blind eye. In a more literal way, King Ashekar I did himself become blind around this time after years of study and practice in the use of Ufieldma. The bright and rich colors of the magic burnt his eyes to nothing, a lesson that would be hard taught to any future caster. This sacrifice was worth the cost. For King Ashekar I laid the foundations of turning Ufieldma from an unpredictable force into one that was better controlled and understood. At least in part, the strict limitations of when and how it could be used were known. The most useful ways Ufieldma was utilized at this time was to create lights, fires, heal injuries, and grow plants, though it was severely limited, since they knew it could only be used in direct sunlight, making it highly limited to when and where. The other factors of Ufieldma's strength and new ways to utilize it were then unknown and highly experimental. After losing his eyes, King Ashekar I created a school for study of Ufieldma in a temple in Horjon, setting the precedent that it was really only the priest and rulership castes that would cast Ufieldma, and Ashekar would employ priestly scribes to do much of his work, such as writing down the words of Unimau and transcribing them. King Ashekar I would also speak to his scribes frequently throughout his life about many important things, from religion, to philosophy, to statecraft, to personal troubles. The scribes found this worthy of note, and wrote down Ashekar's words verbatim similar to that of the phoenix, and even put it into the Igorous holy book after his death, though the inclusion of them were seen as heresy to the elder council, who attempted to remove them from every transcription, though it was in vain everywhere but in a cow. Regardless of these troubles and studies, King Ashekar I pushed hard for John to be formally considered a piece of the Akau Kingdom, a notion despised by the Elder Council, a feeling Ashekar not only didn't have, but didn't understand. Soon, the cries for formal annexation by both King Ashekar I and Horjon were too much to be ignored by the Elder Council, especially since Unimau similarly advised for it. And so finally, it was settled. The tribe of Horjon would properly join Akal in the 23rd year of the Dawn Era. Despite the merge and the Elder Council finally giving in, they still refused to allow any new counselor from Horjon to join the ranks, even going so far as to kill a man who tried. Deeply angered by the council, King Ashekar I left his home in Akal to help found the city of Horjon, where he claimed that he would represent them if the Elder Council would not. 
This feud over the people of Horjan caused an even greater separation between the king and the council, to the point where King Ashoka I really no longer led a cow, except only on paper, and would instead make his primary focus Horjan. Meanwhile, the elder council would usurp total control over a cow, turning it into an oligarchy. The split of governance and the actions of the elder council created a strong and increasingly hostile rivalry between a cow and Horjan with the only link between the two being the Phoenix Cult, though even that was put into question due to the Elder Council being at the head of it. This rivalry would be kept in check only by Unimau himself. For two more decades since Wajan was brought into a cow's hegemony, King Ishekri I ruled, almost entirely from Wajan, as a benevolent and wise leader despite his blindness and governance issues, remaining loyal to Unimau as he guided them in the creation of needed infrastructure and of the ways of their god. After a fabled life of insurmountable importance in creating an everlasting legacy, in the 44th year, King Ashekar I died of natural causes within his palace in Horjan, much to the dismay of the people there, and much to the silent rejoicing of the Elder Council, who quickly used this opportunity to gain control over Horjan and Akau in whole, for no heir of Ashekar's was known, and thus the monarchy could completely end. Or at least, so they thought. Though of course, that is a different story. And with the end of King Ashekar I, his myth comes to an end too.